This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to the service of worship on July 31st, 2022. Let us now join together in the responsive call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way until they reached an inhabited town. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and the hungry he fills with good things. Let those who are wise pay attention to these things and consider the steadfast love of the Lord.
Sisters and brothers, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God every time we turn toward our home and remember whose we are. With open hearts, let us pray together. Holy God, you lavish us with good gifts, yet we persist in seeking after that which robs us of abundant life. We hold fast to our anxieties and give in to our greed. We desire the very things that harm us. Forgive us, purify us, and sustain us by the strength of your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let us now join together in a time of silent confession. Amen. Friends, but this we call to mind and therefore have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. In the name of the Lord, who is our portion and our hope, our sin is forgiven. May our mouths be filled with praise. Amen. As forgiven people, we seek to live in a new way, guided by the teachings of Jesus, which is why we recite the greatest commandment every single week together in worship. So let us read these words aloud together that they might be written on our hearts and lived out in our lives. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So friends, before we get to the reading of God's word, I want to take a moment of privilege to tell you what a gift it has been to me to be a pastor at this church. There is much more that I could say than I have time to say. Desmond Tutu said that God is a God of surprises. And this call to be the associate pastor here came as a bit of a surprise to me. So as many of you know, uh, we moved to New Bern because of Jeff's job, and I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. And I was hired to fill in as a, as a temporary associate. And now four and a half years later, here we are. Surprise, you have been so loving and supportive of me and my family in ways that were a surprise to me, a good surprise. I could not have completed my doctoral research without uh, your help. We could not have done what we did as a foster care family without your support. I have loved getting to know you and, and working alongside you, hearing your stories and your dreams for this church and this community. Much has changed in the last five years with comings and goings of pastors and staff, a pandemic. We have welcomed new members and we have buried good friends. And throughout you have been constant in your faithfulness and in your worship, full of prayer, willing to adapt, willing to be hopeful. And I don't know if you realize how special you are as a faith community. So this time with you has been a lesson to me to be open to the possibility that God will surprise us. As we prepare now to hear God's word read and proclaimed, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Mighty God, you spoke the world into being. Speak now to our hearts. By the power of your spirit, make these ancient words live that we might be shaped into your people, eager to bear your claim in the world and to give flesh to your future. We pray in the name of Jesus, who leads us into life. Amen. So we find ourselves this morning in the third chapter of the book of First Kings in the Old Testament. And just before the story that we will read today, we find Solomon on the throne, having, having taken over after the death of his father, David. We are told that Solomon loved God. This is a thing that was not ever said about David. Solomon loved God. 
And we are told that Solomon regularly worshiped God in the high places because the temple, the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, was still being built. And God comes to Solomon in a dream and says, ask whatever you wish and I will give it to you. Ask whatever you wish and I will give it to you. God offers you one wish and what do you ask for? We could ask for money or influence or power to be smarter, younger, more attractive, to be the best at something. We could ask for the thing that other people have that we desperately want. But Solomon answers, I am the king now in my father's place, but I am young and inexperienced, and I am your servant God, and you have put me here in the midst of this vast number of people. Please give me a discerning mind in order to govern your people and to distinguish good from evil, because no one is able to govern this important people of yours without your help. And God is so impressed with this answer. Solomon didn't ask for wealth or for a long life or ask for his enemies to die, but instead he asked to be able to discern and understand justice. He asked for the ability to tell between good and evil. And so God says, I give you, Solomon, a wise and discerning heart. So and Solomon woke up from this dream and, and went and stood before the Ark of the Covenant, which is where God's presence was sure to be. And so the story that we're about to read is the very next thing that happens. Solomon, now a man filled with divine wisdom, is brought a difficult case to judge. So hear now God's word to us from 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 16 through 28. Later, two women who were prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. One woman said, Please, my lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth while she was in the house. Then, on the third day, after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. We were together. There was no one else with us in the house. Only the two of us were in the house. Then this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your servant slept. She laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, I saw that he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, clearly it was not the son I had born. But the other woman said, no, the living son is mine, the dead son is yours. The first said, no, the dead son is yours, the living son is mine. And so they argued before the king. Then the king said, the one says, this is my son who is alive and your son is dead. While the other says, not so, your son is dead and my son is a living one. So the king said, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king, and the king said, Divide the living boy in two, then give half to the one and half to the other. But the woman whose son was alive said to the king, Because compassion for her son burned within her, Please, my lord, give her the living boy. Certainly do not kill him. The other said, It shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide it. Then the king responded, give her the living boy, do not kill him. She is his mother. All Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to execute justice. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is fun for me on this, this last Sunday with you to talk about this story which I've always found so memorable. It is a surprise to me that it does not make it into the Revised Common Lectionary, so I'm, I'm curious about how many of you out there have heard this story before. So here's why I love this story. I love it for its cleverness. 
I love that an impoverished, marginalized woman is the one who demonstrates what sacrificial love looks like, what Christ-like love looks like. And I love the story, that the story tells us that wisdom is a gift from God, something, something that can be asked for and received at any point in our lives, that there is always the possibility of learning and growth for us with God's help. There is hope for us. And so friends, that's the sermon in a nutshell. But let's look closer at the story together. Solomon, the king granted a holy kind of wisdom, a wisdom that can only come from God, is presented with a seemingly unsolvable problem. It reminds me of the story in the New Testament of Jesus with the woman caught in adultery. So we're told that in order to test Jesus, religious leaders brought him this woman who they had caught in adultery, and they told him that according to the law, which Jesus follows, this woman ought to be stoned to death. Now, there were a lot of problems with this scene, including where was the man caught in adultery? But it put Jesus in a tough spot. If he says, yes, uphold the law, then he condemns this woman to death. If he says no, then he is soft on the law and is not to be trusted as a rabbi and stands condemned himself. There seems to be no solution, no way out, it is a Kobayashi Maru for you Star Trek fans out there, a no-win situation. And as the story goes, Jesus bends down and, and draws in the dirt with his finger while everyone watches him and wonders what on earth he is doing. Finally, when they press him to give an answer, he says, let any one of you who is without sin throw the first stone at her. And in that moment, Jesus changes the way everything looks. The scene shifts from judgmentalism towards others to self-judgment in an instant. King Solomon has a similar no-win situation before him. Like I said, I've always been captivated by the story, especially when I was a kid, for the cleverness of the solution. Reading it again as an adult, I notice the more troubling details of the story, like, like a king threatening to kill a child, to cut a child in half. I notice the desperate situation these women were in. They, they live together, meaning that there is, there is no other family for either of them to live with. There is no protection of, of fathers or brothers or husbands, no family income to feed or shelter them. They feed and clothe and shelter themselves through prostitution. And both are dealing with excruciating grief. One whose child has died by accident and one who has had her baby taken away from her. They bring their case before the king to judge. How could Solomon possibly know who is telling the truth. The story is very clear about the detail that there was no one else to witness what happened that night. After the women argue back and forth, Solomon says, I think quite dramatically, bring me a sword. He says to cut the living baby in half so that each mother gets half a child. One woman says, go ahead. Because I, if I can't have a living baby, neither should she. The other woman, moved by love, cries out to let the baby live and be given to the other mother. And there are some, some great debates amongst ancient rabbis about the nature of Solomon's wisdom in this situation. Was he truly going to resort to violence as a solution? Is that really wise? Did he perhaps already know who the living child belonged to? Was he able to see through the lies and find the truth? In his God-gifted wisdom, Solomon seems to understand that these women are stuck. They can't move forward. And in order to solve the problem, he needs to find out what the women value most. One 
values winning and possessing. One values love and life. And when we get in these stuck places in our lives, we also need to examine what our deepest values are. So perhaps the wisdom of Solomon is that sometimes loss or the threat of losing something reveals the truth about us and what is important to us. The threat of loss brings out the truth, reveals the truth. One woman is let, willing to lose her child to save that child's life, willing to let the other woman win out of love for another. And it is an echo for us, an echo of Jesus Christ, of the extent to which God's love will go for us. One modern rabbi and scholar summarizes a couple thousand years of rabbinical commentary on this story by saying, there are some interpreters who maintain that the first woman is the truth teller, others who maintain that the second woman is, and others who insist that the reader never learns which of the two wins the case. So isn't it interesting that centuries of learned and faithful people reading the same text can read the story so differently? In my mind, it is clear who is telling the truth. But you may read it differently. We can read the same story and understand the story differently. The work of understanding the Bible then is work that needs to be done in a community, in all the, the study and the reading that I did as part of my doctoral research, this was one of the big takeaways, that the books of the Bible were not written for private study. The men and women who wrote these books could not have conceived of a world where you could order a Bible off of Amazon or have multiple Bibles sitting on your bookshelf. For the magic of the modern printing press, these written words that we have were precious and few, largely held in communities as a community resource, resource for, for worship and for study together. So in short, the Bible was meant to be read with other people so that I can hear how you understand it differently and I can learn from you. So it is possible, friends, to read the story of Solomon and the prostitutes and not know in the end who the biological mother is, who is telling the truth. But we do know who is given the living baby, the one who loved like a mother, the one who wanted life for the child. It doesn't take matching DNA to love children like they are your own. On our foster care journey and in our neighborhood and in this congregation, we have encountered so many people raising children, loving children, doing the best they can for children who are not theirs biologically, including those among us who didn't have children or couldn't have children, but who nonetheless have loved children and wanted the best for them. You, you teachers and you social workers, you have done this as part of your profession. This is the kind of love that is highlighted in this story. When I read the story, I feel, I feel like there is hope for those of us who feel like we could do with a little more wisdom. We are faced with decisions and we do not know what to do. Situations happen to us in life and we wish we could have responded better our children ask us questions that we do not have good answers for, and we discover that we have come to the end of our knowledge and resources and experiences. And so we turn to God, trusting that there is hope for us, that God will give us what is needed, that we can still grow and change and learn. Wisdom is still possible for us, and it comes as a gift. In Solomon's case, the gift of wisdom encourages love in the world. And so we take that as the mark 
as the sign of wisdom. Wisdom seeks out and increases love. And after all, that is what God calls us to do, to love God and to love our neighbors. Amen. Having heard God's word read and proclaimed, we join together in affirming our faith. Today we're using a part of a declaration of faith. Christ calls us to live in the presence of God. Jesus lived with a constant sense of his Father's presence. He put God's claim on his life above all else. He joined others in God's worship and praise. He drew strength from the scriptures. He prayed and taught his disciples to pray. We believe Christ gives us and demands of us personal lives that are centered in God and open to God's reality and rule. Christ teaches us to put obedience to God above the interests of self, family, race, or nation, to offer God joyously our money, ability, and time. It is part of our discipline to observe a day of worship and rest, setting aside our own working to enjoy God's work, celebrating with sisters and brothers the Lord's goodness. We need constantly to search out God's way in Scripture, not expecting detailed directions for every decision, but relying on the Word to tell us who God is, to press God's present claim on us, and to assure us of God's grace and comfort. We are charged to pray for ourselves and others with gratitude, boldness, and persistence, confident that God hears and answers our prayers in ways best for us all. Life in God's presence issues in life for others. For if we do not love sisters and brothers whom we see, we cannot love God whom we do not see.
Let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. I will say, God of mercy, and you will respond, hear our prayer. We pray for the church in every place, that wherever people gather in your name, you enable us to listen to each other with open hearts. Give your people unity, O God. Replace pride with reconciliation. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for musicians and artists, Sunday school teachers and learners, ushers, greeters, church council members, secretaries, cooks and cleaners, student leaders, deacons and presbyters, pastors and bishops, and for all who serve your people. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Muslims and Jews, Hindus and Buddhists, and people of indigenous religions everywhere that their paths may lead with ours to greater understanding of the goodness of faith in its many languages and forms. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for this amazing earth, for rich soils, abundant sunshine, and all the foods that you have made for our health and enjoyment. We thank you for clean waters, especially for the waters of our region, for the Trent and Noose rivers, for the bays, sounds, inlets, and oceans. Make us grateful for your gifts so that we protect what we have. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Reassure us, O God, that you desire good for your world and all the people in it, and that your provisions are sufficient. Infuse us with a commitment to share with others, especially those who do not have such riches and who today are hungry. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the leaders of our nation, for our president and Congress, for the leaders who struggle with drought and famine, destructive storms and lack of food or shelter, for leaders of peace movements, and for those who do not know how to create just societies for all who are suffering from the horrors of war, especially for children who do not know the reason for their pain and have no power to change their situations, for soldiers, for dictators, for diplomats, and for those who pray each day for the welfare of others, God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those suffering from all forms of injustice, brokenness, or illness, especially all who have asked for the prayers of this congregation and for those whose well-being we hold in our hearts. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those concerns we name now silently. God of mercy, hear our prayer. God of eternity, we know that all days are redeemed and held in your grace. We remember with honor and gratitude all those whose lives have enriched ours, and especially those whose faith has given shape to our own. Keep alive within us the hope of the resurrection. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Recall us in our rightful mind, in pure eyes, thy service find. Friends, go now in safety, for you cannot go where God is not. 
Go now in love, for love alone endures. Go now with purpose, and God will honor your dedication. Go now in peace, for it is the gift of God to those whose hearts and minds are in Christ Jesus. Amen.